Hey, AP Chem, we are going to be getting into Unit 3, which starts to talk about your good old friend stoichiometry and percent composition. So we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about like how substances are composed, what makes them up, how we can predict their formulas um, from data, and then our good old friend stoichiometry and limiting reactant. And we're going to be starting today with percent composition. Um, when we get into percent composition, one of the things that we need to review is how to calculate mole mass. Now, if you recall, molar mass is how much one mole of a substance weighs. And you can find the molar mass of a substance by using your periodic table to figure that out for a given chemical formula. So for example, H2O, if I want to figure out the molar mass for water, I need to figure out how much one hydrogen weighs, which is 1.001 grams per mole, multiply it by two, that gives me all of the mass coming from hydrogen, and then add that to the mass that the oxygen contributes, which is 16 grams per mole, and then add those up, and that's going to be 18.016 grams per mole for the molar mass of water. So that's kind of the basics. Some other things that I wanted to remind you of when we are talking about molar mass. If you are dealing with a substance that has parentheses around elements in its chemical formula, like in the case that I have here of copper 2-phosphate, um, if you remember for your counting of your elements, the copper here is going to have three coppers contributing to its molar mass. The phosphorus is going to have two phosphoruses contributing to its mass because of the subscript of two outside of the parentheses. And then there will be eight oxygens that contribute to the mass of copper phosphate. So when we figure out our mass, we have to take all of those things into account. You could also, if you wanted to, calculate the mass of one phosphate and then um, multiply that by two, and you should end up getting the same answer. Another type of scenario where you might be seeing something kind of weird when you calculate molar mass is with something called a hydrated compound. So ionic salts sometimes can um, have waters that are attached to them, and they tend to make the ionic salts a little bit less reactive and a little bit more stable. And so for the example that I have listed below with calcium chloride, this dot here is sometimes just a solid circle. Otherwise, it's an asterisk that you'll kind of see there. And then you'll see a coefficient usually and then water. So what this is telling me, it's called, first of all, calcium chloride dihydrate, di for two, hydrate for water. Um, what it's telling me is that when I calculate my molar mass, I'm going to do one calcium and two chlorines, and then I'm going to figure out the molar mass of water and then multiply that by two, and then I add both of those things together to get my overall molar mass. When you run into hydrated salts, they tend to have bigger molar masses because they have lots of water in them. Now, they don't change in terms of the overall chemical reaction you're going to get because when you dissolve these things in water, the water just kind of goes into solution, but they do have a mass that you need to consider when you're doing any kind of calculation for it. Okay, so percent composition. What it is, is it's something that tells you what percentage each compound makes up in a substance, not each compound, each element, or I guess it could be compound, makes up in a substance by its mass. So what I mean by that is if I'm looking at, let's say, one of our compounds from previous um, previous slide, H2O, I can figure out what percentage the hydrogen makes up by mass or the percentage the oxygen makes up by mass. Or in the case of a hydrated salt, I could calculate the percentage that the water makes up in that compound. Um, and you can kind of do all of that. What you need to remember is that the percentage that that substance makes up, as long as you have a 100% pure substance, should be a consistent percentage regardless of how much substance you have. So you could have a teeny, teeny, tiny amount of it, or you could have a huge amount of it, and it really shouldn't make that big of a difference because no matter what, you should have the same percentage of your substance. So if we have, let's say, that calcium chloride dihydrate, it's always going to have that same percent of water that I see in there, whether I have um, a ton, a literal ton of it, or 0.1 grams. It's going to be the same percentage of H2O in there. And the reason why we want to use percent composition is because we can do it for a number of things. We can use it to analyze unknown samples or predict how much of a substance we should have reacting or should show up and things like that.
There are a couple different formulas that you need to remember for percent composition. If you are dealing with a specific, um, a specific like sample size, so I'm talking like, oh, you collected this many grams of this and this many grams of the total substance, you need to do the calculation where you take the mass of the element or the specific thing you're looking for and divide it by the total mass of the sample. So again, if I had five grams of a total sample, that would go in my denominator and then the amount that I'm considering or paying attention to would go in my numerator and then I multiply that by 100%. The other way that you could see this potentially is that I could just give you the chemical formula. And if that's the case, then if you get the chemical formula, you just need to calculate the mass that the one element or substance is contributing and then divide that by the molar mass and multiply it by 100%. So it just kind of depends on the context. And I'm going to show you a couple different problems that we'll go over um, to, um, to give you some practice with that. Okay. One other formula, which you've probably talked about before, but we need to go over again, is percent error. Now, percent error tells us how far off we were from our target results that we want. And if we do it right, we want our percent error to be as close to zero as possible. On the AP exam, they expect you to calculate your error taking your actual value. So your actual value is going to be the experimental data results. It's going to be the physical value you actually got minus the theoretical. The theoretical is going to be what it was supposed to be for your answer. And then you're going to subtract those first. So make sure that you kind of put those in parentheses when you are dealing with your calculation. You're going to take the difference between those two and then you're going to divide it by the theoretical value again and then multiply that by 100%. This answer will come out positive or negative sometimes depending on how far off we are and so to not have to worry about that they generally recommend taking the absolute value of your percent error and then that'll tell you you know it's 13 percent off versus negative 13. so you just talk about the the number value the magnitude of the number not the direction so keep these three equations in mind these are ones that you're going to have to remember off the top of your head these are not written on the equation sheet so you're going to have to just kind of keep them up in the lock box okay so there are two examples that i want to walk through with you um, and you can pause the video or write these down or do whatever you want to do but then i'll do a separate video to work through um, the answers for these. So for example number one, A, I want you to find the percent composition of the compound N2O5. And what I mean by that is I want you to find the percent N and then find the percent O in your compound. The second part then is going to take that percent and apply it to a lab situation. So for B, it says if 15 grams of N2O5 decompose into nitrogen and oxygen, how many grams of O would you expect to form? Now, this in theory could be solved via stoichiometry, but with this circumstance, I just want you to use the percent composition calculation. So you're going to have to apply your percent from A to answer B. Okay, so that's the first example. Your second example is even bigger. Um, for A, it says to calculate the percent of water in borax. So the chemical formula for borax is given here. You need to calculate the percent. For B, a 5.35 gram sample of borax is heated until it reached a constant mass, meaning the water in the compound had all been driven off. Um, what happens is in hydrated compounds, sometimes if you don't heat them intensely all the way, you will end up not getting all the water out. So they actually recommend heating it to a constant mass or heating it and cooling it three different times. Okay, um, and then after heating the sample weighed 3.05 grams, what is the percent water in the compound based off these results? And C then is going to ask you to explain the percent error um, and then, or calculate percent error and then explain your results. So if you need to, pause the video, give these a try, and then in the next video, I'm going to walk through how to solve all of those. Okay, good luck.